Hello, everyone. I think we can get started now. My name is Anne Harrod Lang. I'm the executive director of PHAP. That's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. I'm very happy to be welcoming everyone to this webinar today, Coordinating Access for Humanitarian Protection. This is the final webinar in a series of four events organized by the NRC, the Global Protection Cluster, and PHAP with financial support from USAID, in which we're looking at the challenges faced by practitioners related to access and humanitarian protection. So with that, we'll turn to the substance of today's event. In this series, if you've joined us for previous events, you know that we've looked at access and protection challenges from the angles of how to best negotiate access for protection, and then in our most recent event, how to avoid doing harm to affected people in the process. As we all know, without access, humanitarian actors are unable to reach uh, affected people with assistance as well as protection. Indeed, access is a condition for protection, both protection programming and protection by presence. In most crisis response contexts, multiple protection actors are seeking to access affected populations at the same time. As humanitarian actors are interdependent with the actions of one affecting all other actors in a response context, they often face situations where there are coordination challenges related to access and protection. In today's fourth session of this webinar series on access and protection, we'll be focusing specifically on issues related to coordinated negotiations and approaches to access, including the use of armed escorts, civil military coordination, and coordination with peacekeeping missions, and how these can all have implications for protection. As in our previous events in this series, we'll be looking at the concrete situations submitted by you, the participants, so that we can focus the discussions on issues that concern you the most. So to help us examine these situations, we're joined today by a panel of experts who bring a lot of experience working on coordination related to access, protection, and civil military coordination. First, joining us from New York is Aurélien Boufflet, Chief of the Policy Advice and Planning Section at OCHA. Warm welcome to you, Aurélien. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone, uh, and happy to join. Great, great to have you with us. Then in Bamako, we have Marie Emily Dozin, Protection Cluster Coordinator for Mali. Welcome, Marie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And in Tunis, we're joined by Anne Marie McKenzie, who's the Protection Cluster Coordinator for Libya. Welcome to you, Anne Marie. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. And next we have Sarah Vimir, Protection Advisor with the World Food Program in Mali, but joining us today from Geneva. Welcome, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Very glad to be here. And finally, connecting from Washington, D.C., Melody Knight, Global Humanitarian Access Advisor with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Great to have you on the line, Melody. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, before we jump into the discussion, I would just like to take a quick look at the types of issues we're dealing with in this session. More than 300 registrants took the time to complete the pre-event questionnaire for today's event, uh, in which types of issues, regarding which types of issues you had faced in your work. And many of you also submitted detailed examples of these, which was tremendously helpful in the pre preparation of today's discussion. While all of the types of coordination issues uh, were experienced by registrants, what really stands out is how frequently reported coordination challenges are that stem from different priorities of organizations. So we can see in that second line there, agencies have different protection priorities. That's really standing out as having uh, the greatest uh, impact on your work or really uh, experienced by a lot of people registered in today's event. Regarding issues related to SIMCORD, using armed escorts due to the security situation is much more common, actually, among you than situations where the authorities require 
escorts to be used, or when physical access constraints require the use of military equipment. So that's something interesting to keep in mind. We have examples of, uh, of both types, but just to note that, uh, that yes, that in a sense, voluntary use of, uh, of armed escorts is actually a more prevalent uh, issue than, uh, than actually being required to use um, armed escorts, although both are of concern. Now, for our first theme, we're going to start with a type of challenge that many of you also reported having experienced, that of when authorities with control over access try to ensure that this access is on their terms by dividing humanitarian actors, or in a sense, playing them against each other. I'd like to first turn to Orlean, who would be, um, so to you, Orlean, what would be your main overarching recommendations for how to approach this type of situation before we dive into some of the specific examples that we've received. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Angarad, and, and thank you to, to the PHAP team and, and RC and the Protection Cluster also for organizing uh, this uh, series of events. Uh, look, look, to answer your question, the, the divide and conquer strategy used by some parties to conflict against uh, humanitarians is not new. Uh, particularly in situations where we have significant protection uh, concerns, and in fact, it's probably increasing uh, across um, emergencies. I mean, from Yemen to Myanmar to Venezuela, uh, Cameroon, to name only this. Uh, so that's a general pattern. The, the, the recommendation is very simple. Uh, it says with that, humanitarians need to coordinate. They need to coordinate their uh, approach to access and their approach uh, to, to protection. Uh, each organization needs to recognize that it is not able alone to, to, to address all uh, protection and access challenges. Uh, each organization needs to recognize uh, that each decision uh, it takes has an impact on other humanitarians and may possibly uh, undermine, undermine uh, others. So a coordinated approach uh, is absolutely uh, necessary uh, amongst uh, us. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, negating uh, the individual identity of an organization or giving the monopoly of access or protection to one uh, partner. It means just agreeing amongst us as humanitarians about the framework, the principles according to which uh, we need to operate and the kind of message we want to pass uh, to authorities. It is, of course, OCHA's role to promote that, and we have a series of tools to that end. Uh, from uh, access working group to access strategies uh, to joint operating principles, and I'm happy to, 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 to come back to that during the discussion. Suffice to say that this works when they're implemented effectively, and I take the recent example of Afghanistan, uh, where the team uh, there, the human and country team, did a fantastic job around the COVID-19 crisis and access uh, in, that, uh, in that context. Uh, over to you, Angara. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Aurelia, and uh, absolutely looking forward to getting into some of those examples uh, as we proceed with the discussion. Turning to you, Melody, as the Global Humanitarian Access Advisor for NRC, how would you say that NGOs relate to this? You have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'd like to raise the value of NGO involvement in these access coordination mechanisms that Aurelia just raised, particularly of NGO co-leads in access working groups. Um, for coordination of strategic initiatives, such as the joint operating principles that Aurelia just mentioned, we often see that many HCT representatives are conducting their work through local partners, meaning that the decisions that they support or advocate for on access have implications for many that aren't in the room. Um, UN actors are often perceived differently from NGOs in the communities where we work and they may have to follow different protocols, such as security rules, that differentiate them from NGOs. And the access constraints that are most closely related to protection, such as restrictions to freedom of movement or denial of the existence of humanitarian needs, are often among the most sensitive to discuss. And effective coordination requires trust and buy-in between members, including the voices of those with a, a broader presence in hard-to-reach areas, especially local NGOs, who often have a stronger understanding of access constraints in an area. And it's, it's crucial for effective coordination. Over. Great. Thanks for that, Melody. Now, back to you, Orlean. How can we ensure that NGOs and other actors are included in access coordination? 
I mean, first I take uh, responsibility for that because it's in my opinion, and not only in my opinion, it's in the opinion of OCHA, uh, our role as OCHA uh, to ensure that we build an uh, inclusive uh, platform and tools and include uh, uh, all, uh, all uh, relevant actors uh, in our uh, discussion, including, of course, international NGOs uh, and local uh, NGOs. Uh, there are ways to do that, and we have uh, several good practices. I mean, Melody just alluded to the co-leadership of uh, access working group between UN and, and NGOs. Uh, we have good examples of uh, processes which are used to foster coordination, like on joint operating uh, principle, for instance, where NGOs, uh, local or international, are being involved uh, in, uh, in discussion. The participation of uh, NGOs, uh, local and international, in uh, humanitarian country teams is also uh, absolutely uh, key because this is where some of the access and protection uh, issues are, are, are needed. I would maybe uh, highlight uh, two areas where I think we need to make uh, progress. Uh, the first one is we need to do much more to include our local uh, partners, local NGOs in our coordination uh, mechanisms. Uh, these are partners uh, that implement most of uh, the international response uh, program. Uh, they also have a, a unique view on access and protection uh, issues in the countries where we operate. And I think it's fair to say that we're not always very good at creating a space uh, for them to contribute uh, to the discussion on access and protection. The second uh, area of improvement is about uh, decentralization. And what I mean by that is that uh, our coordination tool, our discussion on access and protection, uh, very often happen mainly, happen mainly uh, at the national level, at capital level, uh, and not so much uh, at uh, governorate or, or sub-governorate uh, level, where in fact uh, frontline uh, colleagues uh, are involved in discussion with uh, with parties to conflict on this. So we need to to make sure that uh, colleagues in the front line uh, are given the the, the 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 tools to 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 coordinate. That means that we need to disseminate what we do at national level. We need to make sure we train. Uh, colleagues uh, in the in, in, in the front line and make sure they are familiar with uh, the coordinated approach uh, agreed upon at the national level. Over to you. Very good. Thanks for that, Orlean. Now, before we turn into the uh, specific examples, just to turn once more back to Melody, what would be your other recommendations for how to approach these types of situations when a coordinated approach is needed to respond to pressures from authorities? You have the floor, Melody. Thank you. Yes, coordination should be adaptive to the context. So as Aurelian just mentioned, national and formal coordination is important for initiatives such as strategizing, evidence gathering, policy development, advocacy. Um, but area or locally oriented coordination can also build trust and provide opportunities, again, to prioritize national voices. I'd also like to emphasize the value of OCHA's role as a direct negotiator in the field which is particularly helpful when pressure from authorities or communities is mounting, as it can give space for NGOs operating in that area. Um, but coordination can be as informal and as regular as a call between a protection coordinator and an access coordinator to share priorities or minimize duplication. It can be time-bound and thematic. For example, responding to a localized event, such as a drought in a hard-to-reach area of Afghanistan, or prioritizing pooled funds for hard-to-reach areas, or even for a specific cluster or sector to convene on an access constraint that affects their work specifically, such as vaccinations in an area under the control of a non-state armed group or as food distributions in, a, in an insecure part of South Sudan. Uh, it's just really important that we keep access on the agenda of the HCT when access is relevant. Often, protection concerns aren't well understood in hard-to-reach areas, and access coordination mechanisms can be heavily involved and responsible for advocating for the needs of those in these access-constrained areas. Great, thank you. So now let's take a look at some of the concrete examples that participants have sent in prior to the event. The first one is regarding a situation where authorities ended up dividing the humanitarian actors in a way, uh, in the way that they gave permission to access affected areas. I'll just read it out here. This is from someone working with an NGO, uh, an INGO. In a context where I've worked, 
the government required humanitarian agencies to obtain special permissions to move and work with IDPs in the affected area. Permissions were only given for three-month periods and given in an arbitrary way to some agencies and not others. This created tensions, particularly where those who had permissions would, quote, keep their heads down for fear of government retaliation or revoking of permissions. So back to you, Melody, what would be your main recommendations for someone faced with this general type of situation? Over to you. Yeah, this is unfortunately a common problem that we face in access restricted contexts. Authorities or communities attempting to control access to an area or demanding beneficiary lists and playing organizations off of one another to achieve their demands. My recommendation would be to raise the issue to the relevant coordination mechanism as we've previously discussed. Hopefully there's an access working group, but if not a cluster, an NGO forum, an HCT, the donor, wherever there's space to effectively discuss this issue and define a way forward. Um, as, as we already mentioned in the previous section, several examples of processes undertaken to develop collective red lines on a specific issue, such as taxation payments or beneficiary lists have, have gone on, but there's times when access coordination mechanisms facilitate these, these cluster-led consultative approaches that take into account protection concerns and are ultimately approved by the HCT, and yet, and, and yet we find that these, these processes can sometimes be a bit too idealistic and too top level, maybe too focused on a, a perfect process. Uh, they may lack a plan or a process to ensure compliance, or senior staff are sometimes unaware of the realities that their staff are facing in the field. So we need to make sure that these, these processes ensure measures to uh, share learning with, with field colleagues and, and to work um, and to work with our, our colleagues that are based in these hard to reach areas to share what the red lines are that, that have been developed. Got it. Thank you very much. Let's turn to the next situation. We have a participant um, who sent in a scenario related to non-state armed groups attempting to tax humanitarian agencies. You already mentioned this briefly. Uh, Melody, I'll just read it out. This again is coming from someone with an INGO. Uh, members of a non-state armed group have come to our offices to say that other organizations provide a daily per diem to authorities to enable access and that we are expected to do the same. Um, so for this, let me actually turn over to Aurelien. What would be your recommendation for how to approach this type of challenge? Over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, I mean, of course, each uh, situation is, is, is particular, but uh, what we see that uh, in, in more and more contexts, this kind of discussion uh, is happening between the uh, humanitarians and, uh, and armed groups. I mean, in this case, what I would do, I mean, the first step would be really to, to, to have a discussion with a humanitarian organization and understand what's going on and who is actually paying a podium and what is behind and from them have a discussion on what are the short-term interests and long-term interests of humanitarians uh, and how we can uh, we can agree on common principle, common position on this issue of podium. Once you have this, of course, the, the, the discussion between humanitarians needs to be about how do we engage uh, the non-state armed group uh, in question and how do we uh, convey uh, our collective uh, 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 position. Uh, of course, uh, it's easier when you have a coordination platform that work well, that are in place. When, for instance, a very effective access working group, it's easier to 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 to, to do that. I would maybe add a couple of uh, comments. Uh, Melody alluded before to the negotiation uh, role of OCHA. Uh, I mean, just to be clear, I mean we are happy to 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 negotiate on behalf of other organisations uh, when asked to do so. But of course, we will not take the initiative on our own to negotiate on behalf of others if we don't have a clear understanding with the organizations uh, in, uh, in question. But in this kind of situation, the added value of OCHA is that we don't have programs on the ground. So we're just here to convey uh, the, the, the position of humanitarians and uh, the armed group in question uh, cannot really uh, affect uh, OCHA programs. So I think that's, that, that's one of the uh, added value. I would also uh, point to something I, 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 I raised uh, be, be, be before. Uh, it's extremely difficult when a precedent has been created to undo it. Uh, 
so what we need to do as a community is before uh, uh, organizations take the decision to pay per diem or, or, or pay taxes, is ideally have a discussion beforehand in the coordination mechanisms uh, aimed uh, for, 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 for that. And I would end up maybe by one little note on the negotiation with armed groups. I think we need to think about um, uh, what kind of uh, messages uh, we send uh, to the armed groups uh, in, when, when we convey a message. Very often, uh, our message is around the human principle and neutrality. We need to, to ask ourselves collectively whether this is always the best message to convince an armed group to, 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 to allow uh, access and facilitate access. Uh, what is the interest uh, of, uh, of the of, uh, of the armed group? In other words, in a negotiation, you need to find an argument that speaks to the other uh, party in the negotiation. Uh, over to you, Angora. Thanks, Aurelien. Actually, we have a very on-point question, just building on, on your comments just now. This has come in um, in the Q&A from Abdelmonem. And he's asking, does OCHA coordinate with all parties in a country in, or, in order to facilitate access in those cases uh, where OCHA is undertaking those actions? Um, does OCHA coordinate with all parties, including extremists? Let, let me just throw that back to you, Aurelien, uh, before we move on. I mean, the, 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 the role of OCHA is, of course, to, to, to help facilitate access in areas where there are needs. And that means that uh, we need to negotiate and uh, and speak to whoever is in control of these areas. I mean, be it uh, national authorities, uh, armed groups, or uh, armed groups uh, labeled as uh, extremists or terrorists by uh, by some member states. So absolutely, uh, we engage with whoever uh, we need to engage with uh, in order to, to 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 get access. There's no restriction. Uh, on whether it's an armed group, whether it is a so-called terrorist group, or whether it is a national authority. Over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Melody, do you have anything you can add um, on this uh, on this question regarding the scenario uh, 1.2? Over to you. Sure. I'd like to share a positive example, actually, of um, a situation where there was a non-government group pressuring mine risk aid agencies with taxation requests in Afghanistan last year. Um, the UN agency received several reports from their implementing partners, and they were receiving pressure from communities and pressure from non-state armed groups uh, to pay taxes. And in response, they convened the NGOs, they reviewed the NGO codes of conduct, including the humanitarian principles, they offered resources for building acceptance with communities and where they were operating and tools for communicating the value of mine, mine risk education and mine extraction to the community. Um, and they really supported their NGO implementing partners. And so this is something that I think could be built upon and, and could be um, practiced in other countries as well as a positive practice for dealing with um, pressure from, from armed groups for taxation. Great. Thank you for that. Now, we have one more example on this first theme. Uh, this one has to do with when authorities are trying to use accusations and rumors to weaken the cohesion of the humanitarian response. This is coming from someone working with an INGO in Cameroon. The government has on many occasions accused a particular organization of transporting arms and delivering them to non-state armed groups in the troubled Anglophone regions. This is to tarnish the image of humanitarian NGOs and limit their cooperation with one another. I'd like to turn to Anne-Marie first on this one. What would be your main recommendations in this situation uh, based on what we know about it from, from this example? Over to you, Anne-Marie. Great, thanks. Yes, so such a serious accusation does require us to try to better understand the situation and verify the information if possible. Uh, but it's also important to remember that when authorities try to divide humanitarian organizations with rumors or accusations, it's also very tempting or could be tempting for us to protect our own organizational reputation and programming. Uh, so it's understandable that an initial reaction from organizations in such a situation may be to turn inward and avoid joint advocacy or presenting ourselves as a united front with other humanitarian organizations. 
uh, I definitely recommend fighting this urge and using this as an opportunity for humanitarian organizations to present a united front uh, on what our principles and our policies are. Uh, a coordinated front, as mentioned by both Melody and Orleon earlier, can range from bilateral conversations between organizations up to the cluster level and all the way up to the humanitarian country team or NGO forum level to address these issues. And I think there's really two main ways that we can try to address this. Uh, first, by reinforcing within our own humanitarian community what our understanding is of and our adherence to our shared humanitarian principles. And then second, by joint engagement and advocacy with authorities to clearly outline and reaffirm the humanitarian community's commitment to our principles. Uh, the first point is particularly important as a means to build the capacity of humanitarian organizations, particularly of smaller NGOs, local NGOs, or non-traditional humanitarian partners to ensure that all organizations understand the, the humanitarian principles both in theory and in practice and a united front and collective advocacy and engagement with authorities is a way to combat divisions or rumors rather than letting the divisions be a driver between humanitarian organizations right thank you Anne marie um so just checking to see if we have any other panelists wishing to come in so not seeing any hands raised, we'll just move on to the next um, theme. So here we're looking at when access is challenged by different priorities of humanitarian agencies, whether this is due to their programming, advocacy, or otherwise. Uh, so let me uh, go to Marie first on this type of issue. Marie, what would be your overall recommendations for what to keep in mind when faced with uh, this type of challenge? Over to you, Marie. Thank you. Well, uh, first, I think it is, it is fine and it's actually very important to recognize that uh, different agencies have different mandates, protection expertise and protection priorities. We have a lot of actors doing protection work, um, national, international actors, UN, NGOs. Some are faith-based, some have their mandates that is deeply rooted in, in IHL. And in protection in particular, you have uh, thematic interests, uh, protection of refugees, uh, protection of children, GBV. Mine action. So we may share a similar objective, um, which is protection, but we have different identities and different approaches. And so as Aurelien was saying in the beginning, it's actually those differences that is the exact reason why complementarity and coordination is, is so much needed for protection. So initially, I would rather see it um, as an asset rather than, than a threat. Uh, because protection crises are, are very complex today, and so it requires a wide range of, of different solutions. And the fact that we have a diversity of approaches um, in the protection sector, I think it can really increase the, the scale and the impact of our response, and it also enriches the, the analysis. So, for example, if you take advocacy, um, you could come up with a joint protection advocacy strategy that draws on the comparative advantages of the different actors. So who is best placed to access duty bearers, who has access to communities? For example, um, human rights actors are generally going public about violation of human rights. At least that's what we've seen recently in the Sahel. And it can be combined with quiet community-based uh, strategies that are implemented by humanitarian actors, and it has a multiplying effect. Um, now, that being said, I, I acknowledge completely the fact that some agencies have different protection DNA. Um, different red lines of what is acceptable and what is not, and sometimes it leads to confusion, to misunderstanding, even to mistrust. So we need to ensure that our action is not going to compromise the, the activities of another protection actor. And to do that, I think we need to carefully assess the different mandates, strategies, uh, priorities of other protection actors uh, operating in the same area. And this is first an individual responsibility of the organization itself, but it's also a collective responsibility. And I think that if you have a well-functioning um, protection cluster or any other interagency protection working group, it can actually be the right forum to, to use um, to find common ground. Um, and to find common, find common ground for me would be on two different aspects. First, um, complementarity of actions, and second, complementarity of principles. 
so on actions, I think that if, as a protection actor, you realize that your action may jeopardize access for another agency, my recommendation would be that, well, first you should act only after giving the matter the, the most careful consideration, um, understanding the risk and finding ways to mitigate those risks. And second, in all circumstances, uh, a protection actor should always proactively advise other actors who might be affected by its action. And on principles, um, I think that um, humanity, impartiality, non-discrimination is central to protection work, but some protection actors maintain the principle of neutrality and independence also as a core value, because this neutrality allows them to gain access. And if an actor decides that he doesn't want to or that he's simply not um, able to implement the principle of neutrality, he should acknowledge and respect the, the commitment of those uh, who are trying to abide by the principle. So in particular for actors who are not neutral or who are not perceived to be neutral because of their activities, their funding uh, source, their association with a specific country, I would recommend that they um, uh, be very careful not to publicly implicate other actors in their actions. And they should also be aware that those actors may, know, may not engage in the same way in coordination. Uh, that's the example of the ICRC or MSF, who may prefer to liaise on a bilateral rather than a collective basis. So I think it's, it is, um, it's, the aim is not to propose a uniform approach uh, to protection work, and it's fine to acknowledge our differences but it's also important to establish some minimum standards on action and on principles. And the spectrum of collaboration is very wide, so it can go from coexisting together, because maybe in some contexts we just cannot agree on common priorities or the level of trust among ourselves is just insufficient. Um, but the spectrum also goes all the way to full cooperation when you have protection actors actually engaging in joint analysis and joint activities. And where you decide to put the, the arrow on the spectrum will very much depend, I think, on the context and on the actors that are involved. Great. Thank you very much, Marie. And thanks for helping us to uh, look at this through the lens of humanitarian principles. I think very, very helpful um, to aid in, in understanding and analysis of the challenges here. So in our first example from a participant looking on this theme, we have, we're looking at a general lack of agreement among humanitarian agencies as the challenge. So this comes from an independent professional working in DR Congo who writes, in the DR Congo, while drafting the protection strategy for the HCT, restrictions on access due to armed groups prevented important protection work for affected populations. The response was difficult to coordinate due to interagency squabbles. Increased advocacy was the, quote, lowest common denominator that could be agreed on, while coordination on concrete programming was limited. So, Melody, let me turn to you first. What would be your recommendation to this participant? Over to you. Yes, my recommendation is that these interagency processes aren't necessarily mutually exclusive to field-oriented, context-specific initiatives. So I'll share an example from South Sudan of a coordinated approach that minimized protection risks. Uh, this was a few years ago. There was a part of the country where multiple communities were in conflict with each other and were extremely food insecure. And so aid agencies had experienced um, food distributions that had led to further violence against communities and they were fearing that their food distribution would further generate insecurity and attacks on their beneficiaries. So a handful of NGOs and UN agencies worked together to coordinate the large-scale distribution of food simultaneously across the front lines of the conflict to mitigate the risk. And it didn't require a formal coordination mechanism. It was a relationship between a few people who understood that coordinating their work would reduce the risk to the population. So I guess my recommendation is that sometimes we don't need to over-technicalize or over-formalize our access coordination work. It can be more based in kind of common sense and relationship building. Got it. Thank you, Melody. And um, uh, th thank you, Melody. And uh, turning to Marie, um, do you have any points that you can add on this type of challenge? Over to you, Marie. Uh, 
Yes, um, in this example, it seems that uh, protection actors could not agree on common protection priorities to draft um, the HCT protection strategy. So I wanted to give an example of where an HCT protect protection strategy can actually be a useful uh, tool to agree on protection priorities and to make progress on access. Um, so in Mali, the, the HCT protection strategy is currently being drafted uh, thanks to the support of a PROCAP. And the uh, HCT members have agreed on, on three critical protection issues. Um, and they have agreed that this requires a system-wide and a collective approach going way beyond the responsibility of the protection sector. Uh, but what I found interesting is that they have included a ge geographical focus because of issues of access for protection. So you have the Lipsako Gourma, which is the region where you have the three borders, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. And this is the epicenter of the protection crisis in the Sahel region. And it is also where we have major ac access issues. So we have agreed that this is where we need to invest our resources and our efforts. And so in the strategy, we want to suggest that we build on each other strengths to deliver protection. So if one organization has access to a remote or hard to reach community in the Liptako Guma, and this organization is the only one able to deliver programs, uh, we want to make sure that uh, they integrate protection into assistance programming, and that all programs that will be implemented in this region are built in a way that they include both um, an assistance objective and a protection objective. And on, in some areas of the Lipsako Goma, that will be the only way uh, to provide protection because access is, is extremely limited. So partnership is important, and I think we need to be ready to, to work with other partners that may not be protection experts but can have integrated programming that ultimately uh, leads to a protection outcomes and to overcoming uh, an access issue. Great, thank you, Marie. I'd like to move to our next example. This is um, regarding specific, uh, an example of the specific programming of an NGO leading to difficulties for other NGOs. So this is looking at that, um, uh, that uh, interaction uh, between the activities of one affecting the others. And it comes from someone working again with an INGO in, um, in DR Congo, who writes, an advocacy project focusing on demobilization, repatriation, and reintegration of ex-military has put other humanitarian organizations at risk when a local population considers that all NGOs are working to collect guns for money. So uh, staying with you, Marie, what would be your reflections on this uh, specific challenge? Over to you. Well, the example is from uh, DR Congo, so it resonates also a lot with the context that we have here in Mali, where you have a UN peacekeeping mission with a strong protection of civilians mandate. So the mission is conducting conflict resolution and mediation activities, providing uh, physical protection and building uh, a protective environment. And this is an example of a DDR project, which I understand is implemented in a context where you have humanitarian actors and a peacekeeping mission. And for me, it goes back to the issue of um, distinction and perceptions. So basically making the distinction between the blue UN and the black UN, so the civil and the military parts of the UN, where sometimes in contexts like in the DRC or in Mali, it's very easy to blur the line and it's the distinction that is not always well understood by, by the community. So um, my first recommendation would be that we need to, um, to first change the perception that communities have about the project. This requires a lot of effort to explain humanitarian principles, to articulate the, the nature of the work that we do, to clarify what is a humanitarian activity and what is not. And it's an endless and, and crucial task. And, but I think we should never consider that we have spent enough time explaining those key uh, concepts. We had an example in Mali recently when a protection actor wanted to conduct an assessment in a village that had been attacked by um, an armed group. And it happened that the UN team drove past the same community the day before the attack. So the population associated any humanitarian actor with, with the attack. And the protection actor found a lot of resistance. And they had to come back for seven consecutive days to engage in a dialogue with the community to explain the purpose of their work, their mandate, the principles. And in the end, they managed to build acceptance on the long run through a direct presence in the community and by, and by working on perceptions. 
So I know it's, it's time, consu uh, time consuming, but in itself, it's, it's already a protection activity that is providing access. And, uh, and second, my recommendation would be to, to anchor the, the principle of distinction. And that for me is, is the role uh, of OCHA and, and civil military coordination mechanism who have particularly in a peacekeeping context, an important role to, to make sure that those types of activities are undertaken in coordination with the humanitarian actors. Because in this example, the DDR project is very much linked to building a protective environment, which for those who know the, the egg model is, is one of the three types of protection activities that are implemented by humanitarian actors. So co coordination for those types of activities, for me again, is, is essential. Got it. Thank you for that, Marie. Next, we have an example where organizations are concerned about information sharing due to potential access restrictions on the part of the government or armed group. I'll just read the example here. Protection organizations in our, uh, in our contact collect potentially sensitive information that they fear, if published or shared widely, would, would, would impede their access due to the government and or non-state armed actors retaliating for collecting information on violations and protection risks that they perpetrate. Anne-Marie, can I turn to you first for this example? You have the floor. Yes, absolutely. So this is definitely something that we've seen a lot and that is quite specific to protection organizations. This fear is particularly valid for partners who may have high visibility, such as being the only protection organization working in a specific geographic location. This is an example where coordination structures can be particularly useful and can strive to find creative solutions to protect the organizations while still ensuring affected populations are able to access protection services. One way a protection cluster or the coordination system can help to alleviate this issue is through organizing joint assessments between multiple organizations or agencies, which in an ideal setup would include national and international partners UN and NGO organizations. This is obviously not always feasible and also might not provide even enough protection for the organization. As such, a second recommendation is using the cluster to uh, further our advocacy and reporting. Uh, so through the anonymization of data and information that's collected by partners, the partners can share this information with the cluster and the cluster can then disseminate the information with the coordinators then engaging directly with humanitarian leadership or other key stakeholders. The cluster can conduct bilateral and sort of private or quiet advocacy with appropriate stakeholders on behalf of the cluster members. Both recommendations, first of the joint assessments and second of advocacy conducted by the coordinators on behalf of their members, are meant to diffuse liability from a single organization to a forum such as the cluster that has the ability to withstand a bit more exposure in a way that operational partners might not be able to. Great, thank you for that, Anne-Marie. And I'd like to turn then also to Marie. Do you have anything you can add um, on this? Any examples? Over to you. I, I fully agree with, with what Anne-Marie was, was just saying, um, and I'm, I'm not sure I, I could say it uh, better than, than the way she, she just presented it. I, I wanted to add that we, we don't acknowledge, I think, enough the risk that some actors are taking, particularly those who are working within the communities and who have to collect um, sensitive information about protection issues. For example, the, the role of frontline NGOs uh, conducting protection monitoring activities. And sometimes, um, rightly so, they, they are reluctant to share the information for their own safety, but also for access issues. And so, as, as Anne-Marie was saying, the cluster can be, can be helpful, and it, it's also fine not to go public about certain grave violations. Uh, if this is going to hamper access for operational agencies on the ground, or if the reporting is going to, to pinpoint exactly which organization provided the information, because uh, as Anne-Marie was saying, maybe they are the only one operating in the area. So um, again, advocacy here can be done either by an organization that has less operational presence and that takes on the role of denunciation, or by a, a coordination body. Um, but I think that do no harm and, and duty of care principles should really apply in a situation like this. 
and we also need to be bound by by those principles as, as well. Okay, very good. Thanks very much uh, for all of the reflections, the insights uh, on that theme. We're going to move to our next type of issue. It's related to the last one, but focuses more on the professionalism of organizations and their staff and how it affects access for everyone um, involved in humanitarian action, particular protection work. Um, turning uh, then again to Anne-Marie, uh, what would be your recommendations uh, to those facing this kind of issue when it comes to more of the professionalism of organizations and their staff? You have the floor, Anne-Marie. Yeah, so I think that issues surrounding negative behavior by staff can include anything from not adhering to our professional technical standards, exploiting or putting affected populations at risk of exploitation and abuse, or compromising our humanitarian partners. Uh, as Marie was just talking about the do no harm principles, the a principle of humanity and neutrality, partiality and independence, all of these need to be at the core of our response. So when we see uh, staff behaving poorly or professionalism and accountability not being upheld, uh, that we need to reshift how we train our staff and the conversations that we're having within our organizations and within our humanitarian community as well. I see a, a lack of professionalism or I guess a, a presence of bad behavior as a symptom of not enough training on principles and standards, but also as a symptom of not engaging properly and effectively with affected populations and having a lack of accountability to the communities that we work with and in. Uh, the second point is the one that I want to focus on as this is where coordination mechanisms can be more fruitful. Uh, we should actively work to enhance our community acceptance through meaningful community engagement and uh, building robust mechanisms on accountability to affected populations. It's critically important that we ensure at both the coordination level and the implementation level that our responses are centered around the populations we serve as a way to shift power dynamics between organizations and affected populations to ensure that we're held accountable and to ensure that the communities receive the assistance that they want and that they need. Uh, this can be done through capacity building, the creation of two-way dialogue between communities and humanitarian organizations, and the establishment of coordination mechanisms that are meant to enhance our accountability to affected populations, such as the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse networks or common feedback mechanisms. In sum, addressing bad behaviors requires a multi-pronged approach uh, of building capacity for staff on professional standards or codes of conduct and principles, creating coordination mechanisms dedicated to accountability and through meaningful community engagement. Great, thank you very much. And Sarah, if I could turn to you, is this something that you've also experienced in your work and how has it been addressed in, in your experience? You have the floor, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, I, um, I have encountered that as well. Um, unfortunately, um, bad or poor behavior might be difficult to detect. Um, for because of few um, issues. First, very often affected populations do not know their rights and they are afraid to denounce abusive behavior of those who provide assistance. Um, so sometimes, apparently, they even receive threats from those who provide assistance. They, they hear that if they call a uh, complaint and feedback mechanism, uh, they won't receive assistance anymore. Also, uh, very important in some communities, people won't speak negatively of those who provide assistance. Um, it's just something they don't do. Second, if humanitarian actors have complaints and feedback mechanisms in place, um, population often do not know about them and or do not trust them. Um, also, we see that the multiplicity of mechanisms is sometimes um, with the, the multiplicity of those mechanisms, then the population do not know which one to use for what question or for what issue. It's a bit, it's a bit confusing, honestly, even for humanitarian actors sometimes to, to know who is doing what and, and for what. Um, third, humanitarian actors um, sometimes have little understanding of humanitarian principles, standards, and codes of conduct. Um, they're not always are not always aware of the potential consequences of their behavior in terms of perception 
in access, of course, but also the consequences for them and for their organizations. Um, I'm saying that I'm thinking mostly of um, WFP partners, local partners in Mali who are who turned quite late to towards um, humanitarian assistance with for more um, maybe in the in development. The fourth issue in contexts like Mali or DRC, for example, it may, it may be difficult to access most areas and thus to monitor humanitarian action in an impartial way. So this leads to, um, it, the, the, it may lead also to a lack of access um, and leading to a shift to the goal. Um, so for me, it's It's very important to engage population in their rights and needs, and, and including on the way they work and on the confidentiality aspects. Also, uh, we should engage a bit more on what kind of mechanism they feel is the more appropriate for them. And um, when I'm saying that, of course, um, asking men and women um, differently, and even children. Also, systematically provide feedback to the people who use those mechanisms. Uh, this is something that is very much appreciated. With, we've seen it in, uh, in Mali with WSP. Um, and also communicate more widely to, communi to communities on the changes um, that, prompted, uh, that were prompted by the feedback and complaints. Also, a very important uh, element, as I've mentioned just before, is to train partners on humanitarian action, humanitarian principles, um, and also warn them on, um, on, on the negative and the consequences of the negative behavior. Sometimes not, they do not really know what are the consequences of uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. They don't really know what is uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. So I think it, it's very important to engage a lot with our partners. We, we do, as agencies, have a responsibility in doing so. Um, and finally, I think coordination, again, is extremely important. Um, so in terms of protection, but also in terms of accountability to a particular population, and specifically, as um, Anne-Marie just said, uh, the centralized um, compliance and feedback mechanism is key to increase protection monitoring, but also to reduce um, potential confusions around existing mechanisms for populations. Um, also, it helps uh, provide more consistent information to populations through those common mechanisms, information mechanisms, for example. Um, also, there is, it, it provides oppor opportunities to coordinate, for example, with the access working group, uh, if there is one, to improve general perception. And this is a, a tool, a key tool to increase access. Um, and of course, uh, this could also reduce costs and maximize impact. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Sarah. Now, our first example on this theme focuses on how this type of situation uh, concerns about the professionalism or reputation of work of one entity can affect others, how this can play out within the UN system and beyond. It's submitted by someone working with a local NGO in DRC, and I note that it does uh, echo a number of the issues that have already been raised in the session, but I do think it's a large enough concern. It's certainly worth um, uh, worth examining again from this angle. I'll just read the example now. In remote areas and even in cities, populations do not differentiate between an employee of MONUSCO and an employee of an agency of the United Nations Common System in the DRC, or even INGOs for that matter. When the population makes a negative assessment of the intervention of the UN mission in terms of its work of protect protecting civilian populations, all of the UN agencies are pinned down. All protest events aimed at the eviction of MONUSCO simultaneously target the entire system as a single body. On several occasions, barricades were erected against the movement of system vehicles, including the throwing of stones on the installations and rolling stock or vehicles indiscriminately. Now, Anne-Marie, if I'll turn to you, you're currently working with an NGO, but I think you, you've also faced similar situations as this. What would be some reflections from your side on this kind of challenge? Over to you, Anne-Marie. 
Yeah, so I, I will take a, a slightly different lens, uh, drifting away from the UN peacekeeping missions and instead highlighting as well that UN political missions can also impact humanitarian access or acceptance by communities uh, due to their different priorities as well. Uh, this can specifically impact protection organizations who work on protection issues and violations, which in some ways may overlap with the work of a political mission. There is certainly difficulty in navigating this as a UN mission in a country has a very specific mandate and specific work to do distinct from our humanitarian imperative. It can also be difficult, as this example points out, for us as humanitarians to dif differentiate ourselves from non-humanitarian partners or political arms or MUNISCO as the case may be, to the communities that we work with. What this is indicative of to me though, is as I mentioned earlier, the need to strengthen community engagement. We really have to do the hard work, which is meaningful and robust community engagement and acceptance. This could ensure that affected populations are aware of who they're working with in the humanitarian sphere. Robust and meaningful community engagement requires that affected populations be actively involved in all aspects of the humanitarian program cycle and that the humanitarian organizations have a regular and sustained presence on the ground and within communities. Uh, when or if an organization is able to achieve a level of community acceptance and engagement, this issue of a sort of mistaken identity, so to speak, is less likely to happen. Additionally, effective community engagement really underpins our commitment as humanitarians to provide assistance with dignity and in a way that is meaningful to the communities that we work with. Effective community engagement can be fostered through coordination mechanisms by the sharing of best practices, by actor or stakeholder mappings of communities and key community focal points and groups, as well as the creation of key messaging or training on how to effectively engage with communities. This also requires us to discuss with communities who we are, the work that we do, and our relationship with a political mission or a peacekeeping mission. As mentioned earlier, the key is really to get to know the communities who we work with, as well as for them to know us as a way to strengthen our access and avoid being confused with non-humanitarian partners. Thank you very much for that. I'd also like to highlight we're getting some great input as well from participants responding to the poll here, sharing your own recommendations for how to address situations where access for protection is put at risk due to the behavior or professionalism, lack of professionalism of other organizations. Uh, some great inputs there. I do recommend scrolling through and um, you can use, uh, you'll be able to see that in the recording as well of the event. So if you'd like to go back after afterwards to review some of the participant input as well, uh, that will be a very valuable resource. We're going to turn next to a set of examples that look at the problem of staff of certain organizations sexually abusing community members. Um, unfortunately, this is an issue that we continue to see in multiple contexts, and we did receive a number of examples, um, sadly, from participants um, who are aware of this kind of issue uh, where they're working. Um, apart from the direct effects on the victims of this abuse, this, of course, also affects the humanitarian response as a whole, in particular in terms of trust and then by extension, access. So I'll just read these in succession here. The first is coming from someone with an INGO, again in DRC, who writes, one staff member of an, ING, of an NGO broke the code of conduct and abused a girl in the community. Other humanitarian staff from different organizations were then threatened by the local population. And we have a colleague with a UN agency in Uganda who writes from that context, in the recent past, several protection-related accusations have come up and been reported. Cases of requests for financial or sexual abuse have been lodged against some agency staff. This has been linked to access issues. And then from a colleague with an INGO in Nigeria who writes, Agency staff taking undue advantage of beneficiaries for sex 
which communities found unacceptable and drew a backlash against other staff. Anne-Marie, like many of the other issues we're looking at today, this is of course a huge topic in itself, but what would be some, uh, some reflections or just your main recommendation for how to approach this uh, type of problem in terms of its relationship to access? Over to you, Anne-Marie. Yeah, so as you rightly mentioned, this is definitely a huge issue that uh, perhaps even merits a further conversation uh, and ideas to be presented uh, that we might not even have time for today. But uh, what this situation really highlights the need for is investing in robust prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, or uh, PSCA, mechanisms at multiple levels. In order for prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse to be effective, it must be addressed at both the individual organizational level and at the country level through collective efforts or coordinated efforts, such as a PSEA network. A robust and active PSEA network plays many different roles, including ensuring individual organizational commitments, such as mandated TORs or codes of conduct for staff, and the network can provide training on what power, abuse, and exploitation are, and also can create mechanisms for reporting suspicions of incidences and investigation mechanisms. A PSEA network can also establish a coordinated effort to strengthen outreach with affected communities to ensure people understand their rights, the roles of humanitarian organizations, and very importantly, reporting mechanisms for PSEA allegations. Community outreach by PSEA network members should also include information about retaliation. Abuse, exploitation, and retaliation are, are antithetical to our humanitarian ethos. However, they, we know that they do exist, and they hurt and threaten, as you mentioned earlier, both the survivors and people, communities who are potential beneficiaries. This is why it's incredibly important for us to have the conversation on how to strengthen our response to PSEA and to also create a culture of zero tolerance. We have a long way to come on the issue of abuse, exploitation, and power within our sector, and it will require a serious amount of hard work to ensure that we do not tolerate abuse or retaliation. I do think, though, like I mentioned earlier, this requires a bit more of a comprehensive and in-depth discussion, but the way that coordination can really play into this is through this collective effort, uh, through a PSEA network, and through reporting mechanisms to show our accountability to the populations that we work with. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And now we'll turn to our final type of issue that we'll be looking at today, and that is of civil military coordination and how it relates to access for protection, in particular the use of armed escorts. I'd like to turn first to Aurélien. In general, what would you consider to be the most important aspects to keep in mind in these kinds of situations where uh, we're looking at the use of armed escorts? Over to you, Aurélien. Thank you. Maybe just a, one general comment on civil uh, military coordination in this context. I mean, just to, to, to reaffirm how essential it is to, to our mission to have a dialogue with armed actors in the areas where we operate, uh, to negotiate access, but also to, 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 to discuss some protection issues. And in that regard, uh, team court officers are here to open doors to protection actors and raise some protection concerns uh, with, um, with uh, military actors. So, uh, this being said, now turning to armed escorts, uh, I think the 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 the, the angle uh, or the thing we 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 don't look at enough, uh, in my opinion, in in, in some context, is the, the the specific risks created by uh, armed escorts uh, when we when we use them. Uh, security risks for humanity and themselves, of course, because. Uh, the armed actors we use to escort us might be targeted by, uh, by, by others. Security risks for humanitarian actors who don't use armed escorts because they might be put under pressure to actually pay uh, escorts. And most importantly, security risks and protection risks for the population we serve. And uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, marie Emilie in particular working in Mali, uh, know very well uh, what kind of protection risks uh, for population, the presence of, uh, of, of, of the peacekeeping mission uh, has, uh, has created. Um, 
I mean, that's why the ISC uh, has uh, come up with some guidelines on the use of armed escort and uh, made the use of uh, armed escort a, 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 a last resort. Uh, and what it means is that before uh, deciding to use armed escort, as you mentioned, we have a, a responsibility to explore uh, alternatives. Uh, these alternatives include, uh, of course, building acceptance and community engagement, building an environment with communities and armed groups uh, that allow us to operate. Uh, it includes uh, also, for instance, uh, the uh, area of security. So having a dialogue with military actors to not escort us, but provide uh, increased security in the area where we, 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 we operate. And this uh, approaches have a good result. I mean, we saw it in Mali with uh, uh, the guidelines uh, on the use of armed escort, which were implemented uh, at field level, and I believe uh, were enacted in 2013 and are still in use uh, today. Maybe two last comments uh, on, uh, on on that. I think one thing which is important is, is to train and disseminate these guidelines and this principle with armed actors themselves including uh, peacekeepers. Uh, too often, uh, we focus uh, the training uh, on humanitarian staff, and this should continue. But I think we also need to make sure that uh, military actors, armed actors, really understand uh, our principles and what these guidelines uh, say. Uh, my final command is to say that, as I said before, it's always very difficult to undo uh, something which has been implemented to, 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 or to, to, to come back on a precedent. Uh, so, when you decide to use armed escort, uh, if you do it in an uncoordinated manner, uh, you risk undermining others. And we saw that uh, in DRC in the context of the Ebola crisis, where part of uh, humanitarians uh, decided to, to use armed escort. Uh, this really created enormous problems uh, for other humanitarian actors uh, in the effort to respond to, to protection and humanitarian needs in India. Over to you, Thanks, Aurelia. Now, Sarah, you've been working on these kinds of issues, I know, in Mali and elsewhere. What would be your thoughts on it? Over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, there are three key aspects um, that uh, I would like to, to consider. Um, first, as it was mentioned earlier, but um, I, I think it's worth repeating that humanitarian coordination plays a key role. Um, indeed, a lack of common understanding of the risks in terms of perception um, in the case of the use of armed um, escorts uh, and the impact on access and protection um, are huge. So we we really need to um, yeah to build a, a common understanding. Also, once a common understanding is achieved at THCT level. Um, Common standards and practices um, need to be drafted, um, as it was the case, for example, in Mali with the guidelines that are, yeah, and, uh, and in DRC as well. Um, but also, it needs to be communicated well to the colleagues at the local level, at the front lines, and also help them adapt it and implement it. Because very often, um, I think there is one understanding at very principles at the HCT level, but um, then it is not necessarily communicated at the local level, and very often there is a risk transfer from international organizations to more local organizations that are not necessarily equipped um, with that. And that might come from, and, um, and the staff might come from the same area, so they're not necessarily um, subjected to the same kind of risk. Um, I think it's something we, we tend to, to forget sometimes. Um, the standards um, and, uh, and the practices need to make of the impact in terms of perception on the long term, and not only like in the next week, but really on the long term, and also on a broader geographical scope. Because, for example, what we do in Mali at the moment may impact humanitarian action in Burkina Faso and in Niger. Um, for example. So this coordinated approach and a consistency between policy discourse and practices is obviously key at all times. Also, I think it's very important to um, agree upon the same, like a common terminology um, on how to qualify armed actors um, and the way we will engage them. Also, another, another thing, another point here um, is 
to train humanitarian actors and or to share best practices on how to engage um, at, a, at local level. So Ucha did facilitate this kind of discussions in Mali or in the RC in the Kasai, for example, where NGOs who had developed tools, uh, very specific and tailored tools to access, um, shared it with other actors, and it's something that works quite well. Another aspect I wanted to highlight is to um, identify acceptable alternatives to the use of armed escorts. Um, that when I say acceptable, it's by both parties, by um, humanitarian actors, and in this case, the government, and then the military. Um, so this is very key, and it was, it was said already by Aurélien, I think um, it will help having a stronger weight when engaging authorities, and armed groups. Um, so I think it's very important to have this consistency in this, um, this uh, coordinated approach. So those more acceptable strategies can be uh, can uh, include security areas like patrolling, security bubbles like in uh, CAR, for example, where humanitarian actors and the military do not live at the same time at the same place, and they 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 are not in the same um, area at the same time. Um, of course, engagement with communities through accountability to affected population, for example, uh, is key at all times, um, um, and it really remains a central aspect to prevent risks and increase access. In Mali, for example, we see that incidents uh, against national and international NGOs occur specifically when um, populations and armed actors do not really know who the military actors are and what they are doing in the area. They are often suspected of being um, spies, um, so it's very important to engage in the long term. I also would like to emphasize that engaging any actor, including armed actors on access and communities on acceptance, is often seen as a one-time event, while um, it's a very long-term strategy. And it's also a prerequisite to a successful negotiation because before negotiating, um, some level of mutual trust needs to be um, achieved. Also, the, the type of negotiation needs to be tailored because it depends a lot on the type of actor, on the type of assistance. Um, so I think it's very tailored, and specific, locally specific um, kind of engagement and negotiation needs to be. Uh, to be conducted by each organization, even if, if of course, OCHA can support the whole process, facilitate the discussions, and also engage some of the actors when necessary. Um, also, I mentioned it before, but um, I really want to emphasize that, uh, is that the risk is often transferred to local actors um, for different reasons, um, which may put them at risk um, much more than expatriates. And very often, like in the case of Mali, I was was based in, in Moti, and we realized that um, it was sometimes much easier for expatriates to engage some of the, um, of the armed groups in the area. Um, and the last aspect, which is more operational, is obviously to once the, the government has agreed um, upon an acceptable, acceptable um, kind of uh, alternative to the use of armed escorts is to engage both humanitarian actors and the military on their respective mandates. That's also like a long-term process, um, because we often forget that the respective mandates are not always very well understood by each of the parties. We'll get back to that later with um, other examples. Um, and also, it's very important to ensure if to follow up on the implementation of alternatives. Um, and that can be done by OCHA and civil military coordination officers. Um, yes, I, I have some other examples, but um, I'll leave it for after, maybe. Thank you. Okay, very good. And uh, looking forward to, to getting back to uh, some of those examples then that you have. We'll look first at um, a set of scenarios submitted by uh, participants that concern when authorities require the use of armed escorts. The first comes from a colleague working with an INGO who writes, due to instability and risk of attacks and or kidnapping, we have had a requirement, 
by the government to have armed escorts when travel involves going out of the capital. These have usually been in a vehicle that the organization hires so that it travels in a convoy with the vehicle taking NGO staff. We also have an example shared by a colleague with a UN agency in Mozambique who writes, when government armed forces require an armed escort convoy to be used in certain areas, they often insert or try to insert their armed personnel into private and or NGO vehicles, thus increasing their risk of becoming a target by the insurgents. Can I ask you first, Sarah, um, what are your reflections on these two kinds of examples? So when we're looking at a requirement um, to have an armed escort, back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so again, this matter is more linked to engaging um, the government, I guess, uh, more than SIM card, which is, as I see it at least, uh, much more operational because um, obviously the military obey a governmental agenda. So again, and as mentioned earlier, it is key to have a common humanitarian positioning first um, on how to engage the, the government on, on the question and then to, um, to, to have a red line in terms of alternatives um, to the use of escorts. Then agree on um, standards and also Again, um, the common ter terminology. Um, so then, an advocacy can be conducted by humanitarian actors, by the HCT, um, led usually by OCHA, um, based on the principles of humanitarian action, also re explaining what humanitarian actors do, how they do it. Um, it's worth saying that governments often fear that humanitarian actors will support armed actors. Um, that are qualified, um, that are qualified enemies, um, but this has obviously an impact on the civilian population if we um, are not able to engage them or if we use armed escorts to um, access some of the areas that are not necessarily under, under government control. So it's very important to engage at the, at the highest level um, with positive examples of community and action, and reminding the government also of its duties and obligations um, under IHL towards civilian and, and its territory. I know that at the moment, for example, in Burkina Faso, it's, uh, it's extremely difficult to engage the government on those questions because they deny the fact that it's a non-international armed conflict since they qualified their opponent terrorists, um, which, of course, from an IHL point of view, doesn't have um, it doesn't make sense, but um, it's very difficult to then um, engage, um, remind the government of its duties. Um, it's also very important, I think, to remind each actor and also the government to um, of the of the the only interests of the humanitarian actors, meaning hum, um, to to assist uh, population um, that are affected. Um, it's also um, important to remind the government that the use of escorts might also increase risk, increase risk not only for humanitarian actors, but also the, the population we are serving. Um, in the second time, then uh, humanitarian civil military coordination can take place. And it's we have first a single court officer or focal point, usually it's OCHA, and it's, uh, it's, of course, OCHA's mandate to play that role. Um, and then for this synchronous officer to identify support focal points among um, humanitarian actors, but also the military and um, an armed group. Um, also, what we've done in Burkina Faso, for example, a few years ago was to organize workshops with military and humanitarian actors to exchange on challenges and to exchange on good practices. Um, I think it's very, very useful for both parties to, um, to know more about the mandate and the challenges faced by the, the other party, but also to define solutions that are agreed um, by everybody. Also, obviously, provide training to, to both on a regular basis. Um, SIM cards 
um, meeting can be can be very useful. Um, and later, when a relationship of trust is established with the military, just in court officers can also serve as a tool to engage the military on sensitive topics, um, for example, on the protection of civilians. Uh, but um, this, in my opinion, should be done in, uh, in bilateral by OCHA and, uh, of course, in coordination with the protection cluster. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, now turning to Anne-Marie, um, you've been uh, sharing with us um, already several times in the session a perspective using humanitarian principles to, to analyze uh, the situations we're looking at. Um, this case with the requirement from the authorities to use armed escorts, it's a classic example when we want to look at humanitarian principles um, to help us uh, uh, explain uh, humanitarian action to other actors and, and also analyze our decision making in a context. I wonder if I could turn to you now um, to look again at this situation through that lens of humanitarian principles. Over to you, Anne -Marie. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that uh, something the use of armed as escorts to deliver assistance requires is understanding how the principles that we have are not necessarily static or, or monolithic, but at a given time, one principle might end up weighing more heavily than another, uh, such as humanity or the need to respond, weighing more heavily than the other principles, and then thus uh, potentially necessitating the need of us to use armed escorts. Uh, of course, the when, when or if your organization deems that the need to respond is critical, you really need to think concretely about the potential consequences, the benefits and the risks of, of armed accompaniment and ways to mitigate those risks. Uh, I do think it's really important that, as Sarah was mentioning, there's a creation of collective red lines. So this is where the coordination really comes in, uh, is at the HCT level or the access level. It depends on, I guess, the operational context. But the creation of red lines can be used on, on and written on the use of armed escorts to be meaningful and practical on the ground uh, for partners to be able to use. Uh, I also do think we ideally first search for alternatives to using armed escorts. As Orleon said earlier, armed escorts should be a last resort. Uh, and this is where SIMCORD teams and coordinated approaches through them uh, can really come into action uh, through the confliction and facilitating negotiations. Uh, coordinated and collective efforts really do play a role here, and we can consider how joint humanitarian convoys for the provision of assistance, the use of humanitarian quarters, or other high-level negotiations can actually aid in our ability to maintain fully our principles without having to reach the step of, of using armed escorts. Uh, so definitely coordination can provide some of these more higher level decisions on or actions, but ultimately at the end of the day, the various protection actors and organizations, as Marie discussed earlier, have different mandates and different understandings of or adherence to the humanitarian principles. So this is ultimately going to impact how an organization decides to proceed on the use of armed escorts. And it, it's not necessarily a common understanding at the HCT level that's actually going to uh, impact the decisions our organizations make. It might be our own mandates uh, that end up making us decide one, one way or another on the use of, of armed accompaniment. Hey, thank you, Anne-Marie. Let's look at an example submitted by a participant that looks at how community acceptance can be affected by the use of armed escorts. They write, in Afghanistan, there were areas where armed escorts were required for service provision. However, we were able to use community acceptance as a way around this, given that the use of armed escorts resulted in greater exposure. We tended to use beat up vehicles that were never labeled with our logo and very rarely branded any of our work. We'd also primarily use the acronyms of our organization name without explaining what they meant and only verbally explain about the organization's mission and background to community members, being careful not to draw too much attention to our staff. Aurelien, can I ask you, is this an approach that can work in general or for only some types of organizations? What do you think? Over to you, Aurelien. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's it, it very to 
difficult to answer whether it can be used in general. I mean, as we said earlier, uh, each context is different and we need to have uh, uh, solutions which are adapted to the, to the context. There are several things in the example you, 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 you presented. I would note that uh, the, the low key approach, if I can use this, uh, has been used in several contexts, uh, sometimes with a uh, huge success, uh, sometimes with a mixed, uh, mixed result. What I like, uh, in this example is that, um, partners on the ground really didn't resort to armed escort as a first resort, uh, but really try to explore alternative and build community acceptance. And I think that's something uh, we need to, 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 to do, in fact, everywhere uh, we are uh, present. Um, we need to invest in community engagement. We need to invest in, uh, in, in community uh, acceptance. Uh, that means uh, we need uh, time and resources. Uh, it's a long process. Uh, it's not being done in one day. And it means uh, we need consistency. What I mean by that, it cannot be simply a posture. If you want to establish a trust relation with the community, it needs also that you, you, you act, need to be in line with what you, what you preach. I would add also, um, that what we need is really for humanitarian organization and, and donors to, to invest, uh, in a frontline responders and, and make sure they are equipped, uh, to, 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 to build this community acceptance, that we deploy staff that are seasoned enough to operate in this kind of environment, that staff uh, deployed uh, have uh, attended the trainings uh, necessary to, 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 to operate in this kind of uh, environment. One challenge we have uh, in many contexts uh, where we operate as a community uh, is, of course, how we coordinate on this, uh, on this approach, whether to use armed escort or whether we use, uh, or whether we build acceptance or, or both. Uh, between the UN, between local NGOs, international NGOs, and the Red Cross uh, movement, we have very uh, different culture, uh, and that can create misunderstanding and, and, and can create differences of views on what is the best approach. We're trying to, to, to really uh, improve on the UN side, at least, and I'm happy to report that uh, now community acceptance uh, has become one of the indicators in our security analysis. So it's not only uh, security analysis based on uh, incidents and armed escorts, but community acceptance is one issue uh, we look at in particular, and I hope that will help also uh, coordinate better with our partners. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Aurelia. And Marie, I want to make sure that we uh, hear from you as well on um, the general issues of civil military coordination and related. Can I give you the floor? Over to you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to um, to share. I'm sorry, it's not related to the use of arm um, code, but I think it's it's an important point on how civil uh, military coordination can be used for protection outcomes. And um, it was an, um, a tool that was used in, in DRC by the protection cluster. They ha they had a matrix in which they would identify areas where you had pressing uh, protection risk, into which peacekeeping units. Uh, must, should, or could be deployed to provide protection. And we've tried to use a similar approach here in Mali in 2018 with the protection of civilians units of the, the MINUSMA. And um, I mean, I have to say that there, there was not a consensus within the protection cluster members, some feeling very un uncomfortable with the idea that human, humanitarian actors would, would provide information to the military force about areas to protect. But I think that much of the confusion uh, came from a lack of understanding of how civilian and military actors have different mandates and can contribute to collective protection outcomes and how the SIM code um, uh, can be used as a tool uh, to also buffer the, the risks that are associated. And I have to admit, like the, a lot of the lack of knowledge was really on our side, the humanitarian side, because um, I think that at least um, as, as protection cluster coordinator, we are sometimes not equipped um, to, to build those relationships, to, to understand the value and, and the benefits of such interaction, and, and to see how civil military coordination can, can lead to protection outcomes. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a, also a plead for, for a, an area where I think the protection cluster and the global protection cluster should, should invest. Um, on, on training us and giving us the, the right skill set to um, to have those those discussions and, and to engage into those interactions because ultimately it's it's also a way to to improve um, protection outcomes and to achieve things that we might not be able to achieve alone. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you for that, Marie. Um, uh, very helpful to have that example as well. Now we're we're running to the end of our time, but we uh, do have a couple of additional questions that came in that I would really like to uh, bring up. I'd also like to thank, again, the participants who are also submitting their own reflections and recommendations related to the situations that we're examining. Um, we see now when it comes to the question of armed escorts, the participant inputs really emphasizing the need to consider the perceptions of the community to analyze the impact, and also the need to, pro to provide clear communication to communities on why the NGO uh, is using armed escorts. So some great inputs there as well. Now, I have a question for Melody. This has come in from Florence. And uh, Florence is writing, in some of the rapidly deteriori deteriorating situations we find ourselves with leadership that is reticent to undertake negotiations with armed groups. Is there some guidance for humanitarian leadership that would help to promote access to affected populations that can be shared? So some guidance um, uh, perhaps to encourage humanitarian leadership to, to undertake negotiations that, with armed groups that they may otherwise be, uh, be reticent to undertake in situations that are deteriorating. Over to you, Melody. Thank you, and thanks, Florence, for your question. I think there's two ways we can look at this. Um, one is what humanitarian leadership, um, what guidance there exists for them out there. And I would say that I would reference the um, Stand Deliver report uh, authored by OCHA and NRC, um, Presence and Proximity Five Years On. It covers a number of recommendations that are relevant to leadership on issues of humanitarian access. Um, but it's it's absolutely critical that our leadership is uh, is providing clear support and communication um, to their staff and to all relevant stakeholders and parties to a conflict. Um, and this sort of internal clarity and the policy setting is important not only um, as a as a strategy for a negotiation and uh, as a way to present ourselves to uh, various actors, uh, armed actors, or communities or governments. Um, but also as a as a form of duty of care to our staff, so that that they're clear internally about who we're communicating with and how we're communicating. And the second uh, component of Florence's question that I would say is, um, it's really important that members of our humanitarian community that we hold our leadership to account. Uh, we need to keep access on the agenda at HCTs. We need to advocate for hard to reach uh, for needs in hard to reach areas. And it's absolutely paramount that we continue to advocate for uh, areas and safe spaces to, to discuss uh, principled dilemmas, uh, possibly risk sharing or ways that we can foster an environment where uh, we feel more comfortable bringing these, um, these dilemmas or these questions of concerns who we're speaking to um, with our donors. So, so there's a part that we can play as well in that conversation. Great, that's very helpful indeed, Melody. And some important points to leave us with there. I have one more question. This is for Aurelien, and it comes from Salome, who writes, in the context of lockdown due to COVID-19, for example, where the access is challenged by the pandemic, uh, even more than security issues as humanitarians are facing now, how, uh, how has OCHA been addressing this so far, and are there any recommendations for operational continuity? Over to you, Orlea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into access issues into country related to COVID, uh, the human and health and everything. I think that's a separate discussion. But in terms of uh, uh, how we operate within countries, I mean, that's a really uh, good, good question. We've done several things to, to try to, to improve access in the context of COVID. I mean, the first thing we did is really negotiate uh, with uh, authorities in these countries to get uh, humanitarian exemptions. In other words, to get uh, the permission from its authority for humanitarian, humanitarian to continue operating and moving around uh, while the government uh, are fighting uh, the pandemic. And I have to say that in most countries, these negotiations have been successful and we obtained uh, exemptions. One challenge we have, of course, is with the uh, implementation at uh, 
sub-national level of uh, what uh, has been agreed at national level with the authorities. And here, I think there's still work to do uh, in terms of operationalizing uh, some of the policy decisions taken at the central level. I would also add that one of our concerns uh, in terms of access in the context of the pandemic was not to become, as humanitarians, an additional risk for population we're supposed to, to, to serve. And of course, humanitarian programs uh, have been adapted in many countries in order to address this risk. For instance, uh, by uh, practicing uh, social distanciation uh, during food distribution or, or in the implementation of, uh, of, of program. I would maybe um, end, end to answer this question with, with, with two challenges we have. Uh, what we see first is in some countries uh, the increased involvement of the military uh, in the response to COVID. And that means that from an access perspective, in these countries, uh, we will have to invest in uh, civil-military coordination uh, to have a dialogue with the military in these countries on uh, what we want to achieve as humanitarians in the context of COVID and how we can coordinate uh, with the military. The second challenge uh, we see uh, is around uh, the rising of uh, hate speech against humanitarians and increased attacks on humanitarians in the context of COVID. Humanitarians being accused of uh, bringing uh, the disease uh, to communities. And here too, I think there's a lot of work that we need to be done in terms of uh, communication, community engagement, uh, and explaining uh, what we do for, for, for communities. Uh, if you allow me, I, I, I would just like to end by reacting to a question I saw in the chat from uh, Isabel on the risk uh, created by, uh, by a low profile uh, in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Is that okay with you, Anagar? Yes, absolutely. Please go ahead. Uh, no, ju 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 just to say that I completely uh, agree with uh, Isabel that, of course, before uh, any strategy, access strategy uh, is adopted, uh, there needs to be uh, an evaluation of protection risks uh, for population. And, uh, of course, uh, this kind of uh, low-profile uh, approach strategy can uh, create uh, some, some, some risks. And that's what I was referring to when I said that we had mixed results uh, in some context. I mean, this is something uh, which we need to, to consider very carefully. Over there. Great. Thank you so much, Aurélien. And uh, now we're going to wrap things up. I'd like to go once more very rapidly around the virtual table here for brief closing remarks. If you have something brief you'd like to share with us before we close, I'll first turn to Anne-Marie. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. So what I was hoping to drive home throughout this session today is that a key component of access and protection is ensuring strong linkages and engagement with the communities that we work in, and that the onus of responsibility is on, is on us as humanitarian actors to make ourselves known and accepted in affected communities through meaningful engagement and outreach. Also, it requires that we really understand and adhere to our own humanitarian principles and that these principles should guide our work and these questions and scenarios that we may find ourselves in. Uh, just continue to reflect and interrogate uh, the principles that we have, uh, especially with regards to understanding how we can better our access and for protection actors out there, particularly uh, that these principles should be at the forefront of everything that we do, as should community engagement. So. Uh, hoping that access can be strengthened, made better through our effective community engagement and through adherence to these principles. Great. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's been great having you with us today. I appreciate that. Now over to Sarah for brief closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, it's great that uh, Anne-Marie mentioned the engagement with communities. I think they also think the key issue um, um, we need as humanitarian actors to increase coordination um, in terms of um, accountability to affected population. Um, so we have a more coordinated and more consistent approach in, in that area. Um, also, very important, the engagement with all armed actors, um, but based on humanitarian principles. And I think it's, it's really key for each humanitarian actor to engage separately and to then um, have, with the help of OCHA, um, have discussions and share experiences and challenges with uh, other actors also, and also good practices. 
Um, and finally, um, consistency between um, our practices, our approaches, and our discourses um, among Indigenous actors, and also um, more consistency between the national level and the local level. So we really translate our discourses and policies or standards into practices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Great to have you with us as well. And now to Marie, over to you for a brief closing remarks. Uh, well, first, I wanted to thank you all for the uh, very fruitful conversation. I've uh, personally definitely learned a lot. And I'm, uh, I'm taking with me that, that access is a, is a fluid concept and that we shouldn't see, see it as a, as a snapshot, but rather as a long-term um, endeavor. Um, and that protection that is sometimes seen as being quite complex with different priorities, um, it's actually just reinforced my conviction that that coordination is so crucial, um, coordination on our action and on, on our principles. So it's been uh, it's been quite motivating to actually hear from everyone um, because I'm in this role as uh, the protection cluster coordinator. So so thank you for that. Right, thank you, Marie, and terrific to have your inputs as well. And now to Aurelia, you have the floor for brief closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, I'm going to stress the importance of uh, coordination. Um, Everywhere where we take a decision without coordinating with each other, we take the risk of undermining uh, each other and undermining the overall response. So really uh, um, making sure that we, 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 we speak uh, together, that uh, we agree on common approach, common principle is absolutely key if individually and collectively uh, we need to be uh, as effective uh, as we should uh, in, the, in the response. And, and this discussion showed that there are tools uh, to, 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 to support uh, effective uh, coordination. Um, I would also uh, stress the need to invest uh, in, uh, in acceptance, and I don't think uh, we've, we are where we should be. Uh, this takes time, this takes resources, uh, this requires that we deploy uh, seasoned staff in a really uh, field location, uh, but this is absolutely uh, key if we want the response to be as good as it should. We need to have uh, this uh, acceptance of armed groups, of communities, and an engagement with communities that allow us to operate. And finally, I would maybe close by stressing uh, the importance of linking access and protection, which was the point of this uh, series of seminars, but the, the protection aspects really need to be at the center of uh, everything we do. And what it means practically, uh, it means, for instance, that any access strategy needs to uh, integrate uh, an, analysis or, uh, an analysis of protection risk including, for instance, in the use of arm escort, including uh, in uh, low-key uh, approaches uh, to, 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 to access. Uh, with this, uh, let me uh, thank you, uh, Andegar and, 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 and panelists uh, for, for, for participating today, and thank you for all who attended today. Thank you. Thank you, Aurélien. I really appreciate your inputs. And indeed, the, the emphasis on coordination is very welcome indeed. Now, last but not least, Melody, for your brief closing remarks. Over to you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the rest of the panelists for the rich discussion that we've had today. I think it's pretty clear that despite all the challenges, we've heard a, some positive examples and practice of how coordination in its many forms uh, can reduce protection risks. And, and reduce the impact of access constraints in the communities we're serving. Um, and ultimately, that, that coordination can lead to a more principled humanitarian response. So thanks to everyone uh, for the discussion today. And I hope uh, we all take, take these uh, learnings away with us uh, for our response. Excellent. Thank you so much, Melody. And I agree, it's been an incredibly um, fruitful discussion. We've covered a lot of ground today. I'd really like to thank, again, all of the members of the panel, and not only for contributing their time today, but also I know there was a lot of preparation involved looking at all of the examples that had come in from participants to really make this um, really make this a practical discussion. And as you say, Melody, to uh, to highlight the, uh, the positive examples, so uh, positive 
of examples of practice that we can all take away. So thanks to all of you, uh, also to our uh, colleagues at NRC and also the team here at PHAP for all of the preparatory work behind the scenes. And of course, to our participants for very active contributions in the chat, uh, in the polls, in the Q&A, very rewarding and um, great that many of you I know were able to join us for the entire series. Now to wrap things up, I'll just mention that a recording of the event, both in video and audio only podcast format, will be available on the event page in the coming days. Um, and as mentioned at the beginning, this event was the final event in a four part series on access and protection. If you missed any of the first three live sessions, you can also access recordings of those sessions as well on the respective event pages. You can also continue the discussion in the PHAP online community. There's actually been a lot of discussion already among participants in the community specifically on this topic, and I hope that you'll continue in this channel until we're able to all come together again in this uh, online format for a related discussion in the future. So with that, once again, I'd like to thank everyone, both panelists and participants, for a very interesting and fruitful discussion today. This is Inherit Lang signing off now from Geneva. Bye-bye.